Principles of American freedom are grounded in the abilities of the individual, not the government. And it's up to us as individuals to refocus the conversation on the important choices that each person makes that sets the course of his or her destiny. For far too long, we've been sliding towards a more and more government control. Too many in our society have bought into the idea that government-run education is the only true option out there. We've all talked with friends and family about the importance of public education. But have you ever stopped to consider this? What if we took a broader look at public education? What if we defined public education not just as a delivery system, but more broadly as having an educated public? As a dad of four, I know that no two children are alike. What worked in teaching one didn't necessarily work with the others. And I'm sure the same is true in your house. Now imagine, if that's true in your home, what's it like in the classroom? If we want true innovation in education, to reach the widest range of student interest, aptitudes, and learning styles, we need to follow the model of other states like Pennsylvania, Florida, and Arizona, who have made school choice for families a reality. Many parents have said how it has really turned uh, their kids around and given them hope. And a lot of these kids now, it was unmotivated, or more motivated now to go on to higher education, which I think is really great. The more that we can educate these kids, the better off we're going to be in the state of Florida. It introduces competition into the education community. Uh, it forces districts to be responsive to parents. And when you're responsive to your consumers, you're going to turn out a better product. It's a win-win on all sides. You're empowering parents. You're getting better educated students. And you can actually save your state dollars on your, on your budget, which right now we can all use that. This is what we need more of, not less of. The one-size-fits-all approach of public education hasn't served us well in this 21st century. We have to go back to where we allow for the individualized learning approaches that has served us well throughout history and that's where I think we're going to see our success in the future. Statistics cross my desk every day. Everything from spending trends to budget projections to the impact of legislation on the typical American family. But the statistics that alarm me the most are those on education. We as parents have been given a sacred trust, a stewardship of tomorrow that will define the next generation. What our students learn and how they learn it is ultimately our responsibility. That's why parent involvement in education is so important and why being able to choose where your child is educated is critical to their success. I think we, as parents, we're the first educators that our children see. Um, their first at least three years of life, they see no one but us, and we're educating them. I think ultimately when they get to that age where they go to school, we should have a choice of where it is that we feel that our child will fit. And having taught in the schools for seven years, recognizing the need for parents to be partners with us in the education of their children, I don't think there's any better way to get them more involved in education than giving them choices. That they can take their child to school that is going to better serve their needs. That helps teachers when parents can make those kinds of choices. I, I saw it all the time in my classroom when parents were making those kinds of choices and participating in the education of their children. It's good for everyone all around. Because it's very interesting, one of the foundational Supreme Court decisions dealing with education, the great line there is that the child is not a creature of the state. And therefore then the question is, well, who is the child the creature of? It's ultimately the parent. And it doesn't seem appropriate to say that that's true except for education. For that parent who has brought this child into the world, who hopes for all the best, we cannot let them have a roadblock where they are forced to see their child just tread water. We need to be able to have them have hope as well that if it's not working out in the public school, there are other avenues that we can take to help save that child, to help allow them to make gains. And we serve with 90% free and reduced lunch and 90% coming through either the Corporate Tax Credit Scholarship Program or the McKay Scholarship Program for the Students with Disabilities. I would have to honestly say we would, there would not be an innovation school of excellence. Second of all, I think our students would be in a system, stuck in a system that may not be working for them. And I say may not because 
I think there's some good public schools and maybe there's some not so good public schools, but at least it gives them and parents an opportunity for options and they don't feel like they're stuck within a certain school because they can't move on a certain side of town. I've said this many times as I've crossed our state and nation, and it's never been more true than it is today. America's commitment to education is key to both our individual and national success. We can never guarantee our students a lifetime of employment, but we must invest in innovative ideas that will ensure them a lifetime of employability. Only then will success in school truly equate to success in life. Employers know the importance of a quality, well-educated workforce. They look for it when they're making decisions about moving to our state or expanding their businesses, and they're more than willing to invest in it. Uh, in about 2000, uh, with, with the, the meaningful prospect of using our Pennsylvania statute with business taxes uh, to allow the business community to be not just taxpayers, but to actually take an interest in the future citizens of the Commonwealth. Uh, many businesses seemingly don't care. Up until the point when they start hiring and they start getting some hires that can't do the work that they want, then what do you do? Businesses are stepping up to the plate. They're giving kids options with uh, scholarships through our Educational Improvement Tax Credit. Uh, and they are coming up with the money because they recognize I'm either sending this off to Harrisburg and let the politicians decide or I can invest it in communities locally giving kids opportunities and chances that they would not otherwise have. Uh, this is just another mechanism uh, that uh, where a corporation can receive cor uh, corporate uh, uh, credit uh, so that they can uh, provide uh, especially resources for kids who are less fortunate. You know, and it gives kids who are less fortunate the opportunity uh, for a different kind of education that only more affluent kids uh, have access to. South Carolina spends more than $11,000 per student every year for public education. Tell that to a private school educator and they're shocked. Why? Because educating a student in a non-publicly funded school is half the cost. And in tough economic times like we're seeing right now, Finding ways to save money should be a top priority. Nearly one out of every two dollars in South Carolina's state budget goes to fund the educational system, a government bureaucracy full of administrative and government regulations that siphon off half of those dollars. School choice is a way to put more money in the classroom. If you don't believe it, just listen to this. Well, the, the tax credits, the way they're structured in Arizona, end up being budget positive every time they're used because the average tuition tax credit scholarship is about $1,900, but the average uh, amount of state aid per student is well over $5,000. And so every time a tax credit is used, it moves a student from public to private school, it saves the state money. So I don't think uh, you can really live by the argument today that you're taking money from public school. We're not taking money from public school. Even if you're taking money from public school, it's for parents who are taxpayers. I think they should have a choice. But what we've found is that the scholarship is almost half, a little more than half right now, of what we're um, paying per student in the public school. So there's still a savings. We're forced to look very carefully at every single dollar we spend. And we have to make sure that we justify all those expenditures as things that are directly benefiting our children. And, um, and as a result, our, we really don't have an educational bureaucracy because we simply couldn't afford it. Some people have asked me, doesn't school choice hurt public education? My response is simple. We offer school choice for higher education. We allow students to use state scholarships to attend the college, university, or technical college that's best suited for them. Why not offer the same choice to K through 12? For a few students to be able to move, whether it's 5 to 10, 15 percent, uh, if that forces all schools to compete and to improve their quality, then that is worlds better than promising a school uh, will give you more and more money no matter how you're doing in your productivity and will give you more and more money. In fact, if you do poorly, we'll give you more. It raises, uh, frankly, the competitive level 
uh, among schools. Parents are going to judge one school against the other. And uh, if they have the opportunity to go to the non-public schools, uh, or as much of an opportunity to go to non-public schools as they do to public schools, uh, they're going to choose what they consider is the best school. I think that raises a, the competitive uh, environment, and, and that, that can't be bad. We need to make school choice a reality for students here in South Carolina, as well as across our nation. If you believe in real education reform, changes that will make our state and our country better by empowering parents and students, please stand with me to make the choice for school choice.